Hello, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Compost Sequesters Carbon and Delivers Other Ecosystem Benefits with Dr. Sally Brown of the University of Washington. I'm Brenda Platt, the Director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative, and I'll be your host and facilitator today. Um, this webinar is the first in a new series focused on compost climate connections. We have at least five more in the works. I'm so thrilled to announce this. The next one will be October 8th. The other dates are being determined now, but we'll have Cala Rose Estranda talking about the Marin Carbon Farming Project. Dan Mache at EcoCycle has been adapting that work to do studies in Colorado from farms to backyards. Um, Jessica Chiartas is one of the lead researchers for a new uh, research project that took place over many years at UC Davis, uh, looking at sequestering carbon with compost and cover crops. And then for something completely different, we'll be talking to Sasha Kramer, Kramer excuse me, at Soil Haiti about the use of compost in Haiti to mitigate and adapt to climate change. And the, the, the picture that's shown right here is, is actually from Soil Haiti. They're using these container-based, quote, sanitation solutions, compost buckets, that are designed to be resistant to natural disasters. So, you know, after hearing about Hurricane Dorian and the impact, I immediately thought of Soil Haiti and having them come on to talk about what they're doing. So we're pretty excited about that. Since you've registered for this webinar, we'll send you info on these upcoming ones. So unfortunately, you will need to register for each one individually. Um, we also offer a wide range of, of other webinars on composting that share working models and tips for replication. Many focus on supporting community scale composting, such as our spotlight um, on uh, bike powered food scrap collection equipment. They're recorded as well, so check them out. Our last one was on community composting done right, um, a guide to best management practices. Before that, we featured James McSweeney, McSweeney talking about his book, Community Scale Composting Systems. And before him, we had Rhonda Sherman talking about the worm farmer's handbook. So if you go to ilsr.org slash composting, which is shown on the next slide, and you uh, see on the right there it says composting resources, and you scroll down, you'll see webinars. You can see we have at least 18 there right now, and you click on there, you get to all of our webinars. So that's, that's how you do it. Um, sadly, on this topic of compost climate connections, I can share with you that we've been working on the impact of trash and food waste and generally unchecked consumption, the impact of trash and consumption on climate for far too long. I wrote this report in 2008, Stop Trashing the Climate, uh, with EcoCycle and with the Global Anti-Incinerator Alliance, Gaia. And it is just as relevant today as it was 11 years ago. We had 10 key findings. Um, as the next slide shows, two are directly related to organics, just highlighting the um, global warming potential of methane from landfills in the in the in the uh, in a short time frame, 20 years, which even now the uh, IPCC, the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has acknowledged is more like 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide in 20 years. But we called one of our key findings was immediately phasing out the landfilling and incineration of food waste and food scraps, and that composting is critical to stemming climate change. In 2004, we kind of updated a lot of that work when we released the state of composting in the US, what, why, where, and how. I am so pleased that we collaborated uh, with Dr. Sally Brown of the University of Washington on that report. And she helped us document the benefits of compost for land reclamation and carbon storage. And, um, this actually, what's showing here is the composting is key to restoring climate. That's from the trash clim uh, Stop Trashing the Climate report. The state of compost in the US, uh, we looked at the carbon farming project, which we'll have a full webinar on. We also highlighted uh, some other resources that are available, like this movie called Humus, The Forgotten Climate Aid, which is coming out of Austria. It's 
fabulous movie. Um, one of the things we found is that there is a significant and growing body of evidence that is demonstrating the effectiveness of compost to uh, store carbon um, for a wide range of soil types and land uses. And Sally Brown is one of the key people in the United States who's contributing to this body of evidence in significant ways. Uh, before I introduce her, I just want to share with you that we've taken some of these key findings and have been producing some posters and infographics. The um, image in the middle is the long social media info infographic called Compost Impacts More Than You Think, but we have had a part of that is on composting protects the climate and it is in part based on some of the research um, that's out there, for instance, from the Marin Carbon Farming Project. Um, so one of the things I'll just share with you is I don't want to um, steal anything from Sally's presentation. She'll speak for about an hour, which is going to leave us plenty of time for questions and answers. So in the message box, the questions, you can type your question anytime. Uh, we'll be asking them at the, at the end of her presentation, not before, but feel free to start typing at any time. Uh, before I introduce her, um, and hand the reins over to her. We're going to do a few short polling questions just to get an idea of who's on the line right now. So Virginia, my colleague, thank you for running the polls. And the first question is, why did you join this webinar? You, I love Sally Brown. Sally Brown has a fan club. I want to better share the climate benefits of composting. I love all of ILSR's webinars. I want to do something about the climate crisis. So we usually like to wait till we about 80% of you voting. Um, and we're just at 60%. Okay, and you can select, uh, and select all that apply as it indicates. Okay, we're at 82%. So, okay, so the winner is, I wanna better share the climate benefits of composting. There's no right answer here. So good. The next question is, just to get an idea of who's on the line, the options are government, nonprofit, private business, composter, or other. Uh, 1% voted, so I don't think we had participation, Virginia. Is that, can you just do that one again? Open the poll, sorry. Uh, I, sorry, I don't think I can reopen it. Okay, we'll skip that one then. We know that you're from other entities besides government. Um, okay, so don't close this yet. Where are you? So East Coast US, West Coast, Southern US, Midwest, or outside the US? All right, and the results are spread around. Southern U.S. we need to work on, but those of us, those of you, excuse me, who are joining from outside the U.S. thank outside the U.S.A. thank you for joining us. All right, so what best best describes you in terms of are you currently composted, composting, interested <laughs> in starting to compost, want to support composting or other? All right, and two thirds of almost two thirds are currently composting. Twenty two percent want to support composting. Good. And then the last one for those of you who are already composting or interested in starting, what are your biggest obstacles? Lack of government support, cost financing, land space, markets for compost or other. All right, 75% people voting, still voting. And it looks like lack of government support, land and space are the two top obstacles. All right, so for all that 100% of government participants, here's some things to work on. All right, so uh, Virginia's gonna hand the controls over to Sally, and while she's doing that, let me introduce Sally. Um, 
Sally is a research associate professor in the School of Forest Resor Resources at the University of Washington in Seattle. She focuses on soil amendments, in situ remediation, and carbon sequestration. She has many research partners and she has worked on many stu studies involving soil health, climate change mitigation, biocides recycling and more. Um, we have the, um, the link to her research papers available um, on the slideshow, so we'll, we'll put that up at the end. But just some of the titles I, of her research papers tell you a lot. Land application of organics, quantifying greenhouse gas, soil and water benefits, carbon sequestration and reclaimed soils, changes in soil properties and carbon sequestration potentials, result of compost or mulch application, results of on-farm sampling and methane avoidance from composting. So those are just a few of the titles. So without further ado, I'm so pleased to have Sally talking to us today, not only about the benefits of compost to sequester carbon, but also all of its other eco, eco benefits. And a reminder to feel free to type in your questions as she's talking. So Sally, on to you. So good morning from Seattle, where it is true to stereotype, cold, windy, and rainy. Um, summer was lovely and it ended very abruptly, um, but um, we're talking about the heat of the pile here today or the beauties and benefits of compost. And I want to start, there's so much emphasis um, with composting, particularly with food scraps, about the benefits of taking those food scraps out of the landfill and what that gets you. And, and also so many of the people that actually do this question whether they're doing the right thing. So emphatically, yes, you are doing such a wonderful thing on so many levels, and that's the main point of the presentation today. I'm going to start by going into the details. Um, really, when you're talking about taking that moldy orange peel and putting it into a compost pile rather than putting it out with the garbage, there is no question the math is very, very clear. You are doing a wonderful thing for the planet, for your community, for your yard and yourself. And here, start, you're doing a wonderful thing for greenhouse gases. Um, and let's go through the benefits of taking that moldy orange peel and putting it into the compost pile. And why can't I forward my slide? Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, everybody who has a refrigerator has seen some of these stock images of their very own. Um, I was trying to find some mold in my own refrigerator and happy to say that I had to go to the internet to find it. Um, when you're talking about food scraps, what makes them turn disgusting, yucky, smelly, even in your cold refrigerator, um, is the same formula that makes them so good at generating methane in a landfill. They're wet. Um, that um, carrot may look like it's solid to you, but once you take the moisture out of it, there's only a tiny fraction left. Typically, food scraps and food waste are about 75% water, so it's about 25% solid material. They're wet and they're also filled with nutrients. So they decompose really, really quickly. And when that decomposition turns to anaerobic or with limited oxygen, that means that there's a really high potential for methane to be produced. The, the key thing that, that leads you to that is the stink. And everybody who has had rotten food somewhere knows about that stink. Those um, anaerobic conditions or conditions without oxygen means that the microbes that are eating your lunch that you didn't get up to um, use different things to stuff the electrons or the byproducts from eating onto. And so one thing that they love to stuff electrons onto is sulfur. Um, reduced sulfur compounds um, are one class and they stink. They have names like cadaverine and you can imagine what that one smells like. So methane is just one of the broader classes of gases you get when you have anaerobic decomposition. Now methane lasts in the atmosphere about 12 years and normally for climate gases we use a time frame of about 100 years and that's why 23 times CO2 that's why you see that number thrown out because methane 
only lasts 12 years over a hundred year time frame though it's so good at so effective at trapping heat in the atmosphere that even though it's gone after 12 it has 23 times the impact of co2 over 100 years and earlier you heard brenda say over a 20 year time frame that's closer to 80 times the impact of co2 that's why we care about methane now landfills are much warmer than refrigerators. And so if you have that food waste rotting in your fridge, imagine if you put it at about 70 degrees, oh my God, what a beautiful place to rot food and make methane. And so once you get that food waste into a landfill where they will collect gas and use it as methane is the same as biogas, same thing, different name. Um, but the landfill typically doesn't start collecting that methane for a few years till the, after that orange peel has gone into it. So much, the vast majority of the methane that's produced from food scraps, and remember they decompose really quickly, gets released to the atmosphere before the landfill starts collecting energy. So if you look, you get here about a ton of CO2 equivalent for each wet ton that you dump in a landfill. Now, people get nervous about composting because composting, if it's not managed perfectly, can also emit methane. But look at that difference in amounts. 0.05 tons for a bad pile of compost versus one ton. So a tiny, tiny fraction. So just by taking it out of the landfill and putting it into a compost pile, you're doing a wonderful thing. Now, people are always asking me, well, well, what about methane from, from composting? What about the transport to the compost pile? What about nitrous oxide from composting? Am I really doing the right thing? And here's your bad trash novel literary reference. Um, but for me, compost versus landfill, that's black and white. And all the other little questions, and it, I don't mean that you intend for them to be little, but in terms of the impact, the impact of transport, the impact of fugitive emissions from composting, they're tiny. They're little tiny shades of gray compared to that black and white of taking that compost out of the landfill. So here we get the 50 shades of gray. Haven't read the books, haven't seen the movie, but for those that have, you can chuckle to yourselves. I can't hear you. Um, okay, some examples. Um, if you drive the food scraps to a local composting site or collection point versus a truck picking up the um, the material and delivering it, um, there's a difference. There's a big difference in the emissions associated with getting the food scraps to the compost pile. But um, a truck for each um, a 10 ton truck is what I used here for each ton of food scraps. It's about 0.005 metric tons of CO2. If you drive your Subaru, and we have lots of those here, more and more Teslas than um, every day, but certainly not the whole fleet yet in Seattle, you get um, more than double that. You get 0.09 tons. But if you remember um, the earlier figure one ton of methane avoidance and let me scroll back here one ton versus 0.09 tons you are still doing a wonderful thing this is a little little blip compared to the much bigger thing of taking that food scrap out of the landfill um, another thing type of composting site depending on how well you run a neighborhood facility or your backyard facility i will confess we have a uh, uh, bin in our backyard that we use to compost and sometimes it gets a little smelly. If it's smelly, there's a good chance that there are some fugitive emissions. Um, how much you'll get depends on how intensely you monitor and take care of your pile, how wet it gets. In Arizona, you're going to have a much lower chance of fugitive emissions than you will in Seattle in November. Um, if you're a commercial site, you have to Typically with food scraps, you have to monitor it for temperature, time, and odor, and you really don't want the neighbors shutting you down. So I'm saying here as a general rule that a commercial site will have lower emissions than a home compost site or a neighborhood site. This is not a, a, a hard and, and 
straight fact. It can vary. And again, you're talking about very minimal differences compared to the gigantic difference you get just by taking the material and putting it into a compost facility. So to give you some sense of scale, when I first sent my presentation to Brenda, she said, I only have a problem with slide eight because it just looks like you got two, you know, two, one black and one white column and there's nothing else in there. And that really is the point. The other shades of gray compared to that maximum impact of taking the food scraps out, you can make it a little better, but already by taking that step to a compost pile, you're doing a fabulous thing. So this is to give you some scale. Okay. Other thing that people don't consider when they're they're deciding should my community go to food scrap diversion is is what do you get with that compost? And I think as we get to the point where we're in the middle of climate change, it's happening. How do we make ourselves a more sustainable and more resilient society? What what can we do? One of the things that's so important to realize is avoiding those methane emissions is just the start understanding what compost gets you and trying to put a value on that is so critical. Um, one thing um, Brenda's done with ISR is looked at the job opportunities in a community to composting versus landfilling. That's just one aspect. Landfilling is pretty much a dead end. You put the stuff there, you get fugitive emissions, you get land that's not useful for several decades, you don't recycle the nutrients, you have no benefit to the community, no benefit to the planet, nothing happens. That's it. Um, on the other hand, and here we have second bad joke of the presentation, it wouldn't be a presentation of mine unless we had several bad puns and bad jokes, um, long and winding road. In other words, um, when you start making compost, the benefits and um, impact goes so much beyond just methane avoidance. Um, understand this and then really feel good about composting and what you're doing. Um, and so here we're going to move into the rainbow, out of that black, white, and gray, and into the broad spectrum of colors. Here's a picture from BioCycle. Brendan mentioned one of my favorite things that I do is write a column for a BioCycle magazine um, that's going to go all online. It's a great resource for those interested in composting. Check them out, and here you get some clue of those benefits. So now, rest of the presentation is going to be delving into these lovely, lovely colors. Okay. You can continue using um, carbon accounting to look at the benefits of compost versus landfill. And this is one of those studies that Brenda mentioned earlier that I was a co-author on. Um, we used a tool called life cycle assessment. Um, the goal of life cycle assessment is to understand the impact of something from its birth to its death. Um, and they use a range of metrics to do so. One of them is carbon accounting. And here you get um, the full carbon accounting cost of collection and transport, landfill versus compost, how much energy and associated greenhouse gases you get for processing um, in a landfill versus a compost, carbon storage and some of that and um, compost that you or compost feedstocks that you landfill will store carbon in a landfill um, as they can do in soils. We'll get to that. Fertilizer displacement, um, peat replacement, electricity displacement, what you basically get um, using this approach for understanding the benefits greenhouse gas-wise of compost use versus landfilling is that when you landfill, not counting methane avoidance, you emit an additional 0.38 tons of CO2 and in compost you sequester a tenth of a ton of CO2. Okay, that's nice to know, it's kind of boring. Let's look at it from a little bit bigger. Let's get out of the Fresh Kills landfill in Staten Island and go to the planet. And that's where stuff to me really, really gets exciting. Um, the thing that you know if you've ever worked with soil and you've ever worked with compost is compost improves soil. And what people don't often think of is how critical soils are for our existence. And 
the role that organic matter plays in a healthy soil. So here we get to be a little nerdy science, soil science. If you want the very, very readable and excellent versions of this, David Montgomery is uh, another faculty member at University of Washington. Nice guy, plays in a band called Big Dirt. That is true. Um, I have not listened to the band, but I think um, you can find them on Spotify. Can't promise you that, maybe YouTube, but you can certainly find two of his books. Um, one is Dirt, The Erosion of Civilization, and then more recently he wrote Growing a Revolution, Different Tools of How to Bring a Soil Back to Life. I um, In Dirt, you can see the impact of destroying soils and growing a revolution. You can get great um, very inspirational stories, including use of compost and biosolids on how to bring soils back to life. You can even find my name in the second one, but that's not why I like it. Um, what he basically points out in Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations is, and you can see this, there are a number of texts about this, when a range of civilizations have overused their soils um, and destroyed them through erosion or getting them too salty, you eventually see that that civilization is itself destroyed because we need our soils to support architects, artists. To, we need our soils to eat. And we may have hydroponics now, but we still very, very much need our soils to eat. And so on a very basic level, you destroy the soil and you, you destroy the civilization. In his second book, um, the brown the how to rebuild the soil he goes into some of the ecosystem services is a term that's used for this but what you get for keeping your soil healthy food security is so important profitability for farms keeping agriculture and farmers in business carbon sequestration ecosystem resilience so not just for the plants but for the communities in an urban area um, letting your plants last longer in a drought, letting your soils absorb more of the water from flood conditions. Um, these are really critical. Enhanced habitat. If you make your soil healthy, and I just went over a few um, papers on this, you increase the grass on the soil. So there was a scientist, Karen Hodges, in British Columbia who studied degraded rangeland that had had municipal biosolids applied to it counted the number of crickets. In the restored soil, she had almost four times the number of crickets. And what that ended up doing was creating better habitat for birds. So she saw a big increase in number of birds and also had numerous sightings of birds on the endangered list. So fix the soil and boy, does the world bloom for you. Um, here's a pretty um, nerdy picture um, from a journal just basically showing how soil is supposed to work and the role of soil organic matter, which is the dark brown stuff on the top in that first figure. You unfortunately can't see me pointing my finger at the screen, but you can point your own finger at the screen. Um, and how much organic matter is really what keeps that soil um, productive over time. And it's a fine balance between how much soil erodes over the top and how quickly you make new soil. Soils will recycle the nutrients um, and that plant C keeps adding organic matter as the plant, as the microbes release it as CO2. Um, and you want all those arrows in that first picture are a nice, pretty much similar size. You go to soils that we've been working with, I could say, effing with, but that's using a profanity, not appropriate. Um, anyway, and you can see the arrows get all distorted and that brown stuff at the top is way, way down. So the main way that we have destroyed our soils and hurt their ability to function is by getting rid of organic matter in those soils. Now, there are many ways you can fix soils. If you're having a farm that's a thousand acres in the middle of Nebraska, you don't have ready access to banana peels. Food scraps are not gonna be your answer. Animal manures can be a key part, and that's a whole nother kind of compost or soil amendment you can use, but there are other tills, uh, I'm sorry, other tools. Uh, limited tillage, no-till ag, cover crops can be great. Um, 
green manures um, are getting more and more integrated and more and more complex into how farmers use them. But manure, compost, char, and biosol is a really important tools if you have access to them. And if you live and eat, you have access to these and you may not have a thousand acre farm, but if you have a backyard or a community garden or a city park, these are all tools that should be taken full advantage of. Okay. What are the best ways to increase soil organic matter? Um, No-till ag was promoted for a long time and it does help certain aspects of soil health. But if you look at, a this is a meta study, a, a study that was put together looking over a really broad range of publications um, that came out in 2004. In some cases, no-till helps, but very, very minimal increases in soil organic matter. That's um, SOM, SOM is a way you abbreviate soil organic matter, and the increases were from zero, which is not very much at all, to 0.3, and that's tons of carbon per hectare per year. So minimal changes. Um, same author, different paper, looking at changes in organic matter with different amendments, and you get much, much bigger numbers. So for manure, about 60 kilograms of carbon per hectare per year, biosols 180, green compost, that's yard waste, um, 60 kilograms of carbon per hectare per year per dry ton added. So if you're using that biosols number, and of course, if you know me at all, you know I love biosols um, even more than I love moldy orange peels, which is saying something. Um, that's almost three quarters of a ton of carbon per hectare per year of soil. So this is a fabulous, fabulous tool. Um, you'll hear about the Marin Carbon Project. Um, what's so nice about the Marin Carbon Project is they have a really wide range of accessible information. Same thing that you saw in this study, but a much prettier picture. They took animal manure out of a lagoon composted and put it on degraded rangeland and found out that it helps that rangeland and helps store carbon over a long period of time. Um, this new article, Compost is Clear Carbon Storage Winter, this is also coming up in an upcoming webinar. This was cropland. Long-term field plots, this is out of UC Davis. They looked at um, fertilizer, cover crops alone, and cover crops plus compost. And what they found was only when you mix the cover crops and the compost, they didn't have a compost alone here, you, you store more carbon, not only at the top of that soil, but also well down at the bottom and the deeper parts of the soil profile. And that's what made the difference. Um, I've done a bunch of this myself. Here's Kate Kurtz here in dryland wheat in um, Eastern Washington. And here we looked at a range of sites across Washington state, turf grass, um, pear orchards. Um, um, what are some of the other ones? Highway right of way, um, landscape, garden landscape plants. And across all the sites, we found that when you use compost or biosolids over a long term, you're increasing the carbon in the top layer and in the, the top six inches and then in the next six inches as well. More compost, more carbon storage with the compost than with the biosolids, but much better than the control. Okay, here I went all over California with Matt Cotton many years back. And with that increase in carbon, and here's how you start getting to that soil health. Carbon in the soil is organic matter. It is Thanksgiving every day for the microbes that live in that soil. They have more to eat, so you have a higher microbial presence. That means more um, microbes that are the good kind to fight off plant disease, um, more nutrient cycling. You increase the water holding capacity of the soil. That means that the soil holds more of the water that soaks into it from a rainfall. And that means that the plants don't get thirsty. So it's much more water use efficiency. If you think about weather and what the weather we've been seeing is, you can get a sense of how important that is. The other thing it does is it decreases the bulk density of the soil. That's how heavy the soil is. And you know when you put your hands in a soil that's 
well cared for, it's light, fluffy, well aggregated. That means the roots have an easier time getting in, the air can cycle in and out, and the water can get in and out. So compost increases um, soil carbon, wide range of end uses, wide range of studies, and it makes that soil healthier. So by using compost, not only are you getting that methane avoidance but more importantly, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a soil scientist, you make that soil healthy again. Now, some of the things that soil does were quantified in a, a fabulous paper back in 1997. And these authors said, okay, we rely on nature for so much, but we never really put a dollar figure to that. Let's see if we can do that. So they went through the range of, of services that nature provides for us and in 1997 put a value to that of 33 trillion dollars and compared to the sales of iphones gap jeans corn futures and all other things the money that's traded every year was 18 trillion dollars so you can see that what we get from nature including soil is really worth a lot of money if you can start trying to think of it that way now that's what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is try and put a dollar figure on the benefits associated with fixing a soil with compost. Kristen is a former grad student of mine. She now runs a program called Harvest Pierce County in Tacoma, Pierce County, Washington, south of here. Um, and she started as a grad student. One of the things she did was looking at changes in soil when you use different um, organic amendments from cities. And she saw changes in bulk density, like we just saw in the California slide, making that soil better, fluffier, and making that soil better able to grow that lovely purple cauliflower that matched her hoodie so well. Okay, her program started with about four community gardens, now it's 80 plus, and each of these gardens, you can read their mission, it's a great organization to look at and use as a role model each of the gardens that they have, community gardens, gets as much of the um, biosolids potting soil and um, yard waste compost. Their biosolids potting soil is called Tagro and compost that they want. And they get a source of water. They get cardboard recycled from the waste stream as a mulch uh, barrier. Um, for their pathways and wood chips also recycled from the waste stream to make their walkways in the gardens pretty. Um, now, um, I would argue that the soils in this community garden program across a large number of these gardens are degraded and that only by using the tagro and the compost do the soils really gain their health and productivity. So here's your your example and you, a picture uh, kind of tells the story here. This gardener did not want to use the compost or the basal soil product and she planted it using some kind of fertilizer. And this is the growth response she got in the front. Keith is not happy about this if you see his name on the rock. Um, everybody else in the garden planted theirs using one of those compost amendments at the same time that this lady planted hers. I think you might agree that the compost amendments made that soil healthier. Okay, so let's talk about the value of that using the framework of ecosystem services. And here, um, this is uh, Proctor Garden. It's one of the gardens in the Harvest Pierce County program. And it's a lovely garden to walk through. It's about a half a hectare and they got 10 tons of the biosolids compost delivered in 2018. Now, if you think about what that garden does um, for ecosystem services, if you think about what that soil and what those plants do, that soil will store some carbon. Um, if you walk in a green area in a city, you'll notice a drop in temperatures. There's some climate mitigation of the urban heat island effect. And if you've been on um, Asphalt in August versus in a park in August, you know exactly what I mean here. I'm assuming you're not one of the 9% listening from uh, an international or out of the US and potentially in the Southern hemisphere. Um, there are papers out there about 
the ability of a fixed soil to let that storm water infiltrate, soak into it, and so you get storm water diversion, reduced risk of flooding. These are all peer-reviewed studies. Um, by using these composts on the soil, you're taking wastes and you're treating them and recycling them. And as we saw in a previous picture, you get increased net primary productivity. That's um, science jargon for making, for saying you get a damn big head of cauliflower compared to those those very sorry looking um, vegetables in that control plot. And you're also aiding soil formation, which is really important. Now, um, here to drive home that point that it's not just um, that one lady's sad looking plot. This is Toby Una, a current grad student, and she's looking at a plot of soil that got NPK fertilizer and one that got the um, Tagro compost. And I bet you can figure out which is which. Um, pretty clear demonstration of function here. Um, how much is that worth? Let's let's calculate it out. So. Costanza, the guy that wrote that paper in 1997 with the Ecosystem Services, wrote another paper in 2007, and he put the value of soil at 6,600 per hectare per year. And if you change those 2007 dollars, you get a value, a current value of about 8,200 dollars. And I think that you would argue here or agree with my argument that adding the compost to that soil increased its ability to function. So at 20 tons of compost per hectare, if you take all the value and give it to the compost, that comes out to about $410 worth of value for each ton of compost you applied to that degraded soil. Now, you can argue here. You can say that the compost was only a fraction of that response. Um, I dare you to with this picture, but you can do it. But even still, say it was only a quarter of the response. You're still talking $100 a ton of compost for the value for the ecosystem services that that compost has let the soil provide. That's a lot. Um, Another way to look at it is through a USDA program. Um, USDA has a program called Conservation Reserve, or CRP. And what the goal of that program is, is to take degraded soils and help them come back to life. And the way they do that is by letting them rest, letting them not get cropped and tilled every year, but letting them stay with a perennial cover, not plowed. They pay farmers not to farm sensitive soils. Um, and here's a map of how much and where the different um, outlays were. And you can see in Washington state, a good number of soils are degraded and have a lot of those colors in them. And we can use the pay rate and the rate of soil formation from the Conservation Reserve Program to get another way of looking at how much making that soil alive is worth. Okay, uh, Montgomery, David, Montgomery, who wrote those books that you should immediately, or at least after the webinar, go to local bookseller, Amazon, wherever, and get, especially the hopeful one. Um, he also wrote a range of academic papers. And in one of them, he said that the rate of soil formation, how, how quickly nature makes soil if left to its own devices, is about 0.003 inches per year. That means it would take you well over a thousand years to build six inches of topsoil. If you work with compost and you have access to as much as you want, you know you can do that in a month. So normally CRP or a few years ago, CRP was paying about $128 per hectare to farmers every year not to farm. And you take that 1800 years, um, it would take about $241,000 to rebuild the soil. And I did some kind of multiplication with the 20 tons per hectare and got that it's about 12,500 per ton. Now, you can see there's a big range between $400 and $12,000 a ton. We're not really good at putting precise values on um, the, the importance of soil, but realize either way, 
when you look at the value of compost, that's a significant value with what the compost enables soil to do. And it's as, or I would argue, much more significant than just focusing on the methane avoidance. Because we need these soils to keep functioning in order for us to survive. Okay, so let's go now to impact on people. Because any of you who have worked with soil or work with growing food or work with composting knows that, yeah, it's changed you in certain ways. Um, here are just some examples. Um, and here again, we can focus on the garden in Proctor, the one that we saw the aerial picture of. Um, when you look at impact on people, and again here, this is from peer-reviewed literature, when you bring a community garden that's used by the community to a neighborhood, um, you reduce crime in that neighborhood. People are back in the streets, they're at the garden, they're talking to their neighbors, and um, it you grow, you start growing um, sugar snap peas instead of finding drug paraphernalia. Um, talking to your neighbors, knowing your neighbors increases community strength. Um, you can ask your neighbor for a favor. You feel more secure in your neighborhood because you know people in your neighborhood now. You start understanding how um, the environment works by watching that whole process of growth and decay um, and growing plants that compost helps you grow. And then you get actual physical health benefits. You can eat better when you grow your own food. Um, you have an improved diet and you move around more. Um, and there are benefits associated with each of these things. So if you start thinking about how much food you can grow, um, I did two books on urban agriculture a while back um, and they're academic books. And so I, I'm happy to provide names of them, but um, here, this is a chapter from one of them. And this was a family that gardened in Seattle and we found their stuff online and got them to write a chapter for the book. And this guy was a, a faculty member at the medical school at University of Washington. And he and his family were very anal about their garden. They were fabulous gardeners and they kept a very detailed record of exactly how much they grew, how much it was worth and came up with a dollar value of how much they got out of their garden a year and they also calculated the cost. It's a great chapter, They're really neat people. Um, but from their garden, they got um, over $4,000 worth of produce in a, 6, 000, a 600 square foot plot. So Proctor has about 50 plots of that size. Um, I can tell you as a gardener with uh, plenty of arugula that's gone to seed and with moles and voles that have eaten half of my carrots, I'm not going to get $4,000 for my 600 square foot plot. But um, you can um, take a, a fraction of that and you can say this is still too high and divide it further. But let's say that each plot got $1,000 worth instead of $4,000 worth. That gives you another value for compost just in terms of the food grown because you saw the difference in yield and the pre-compost and post-compost of about $5,000 per ton of compost. So this is in addition to those ecosystem services. This is, or, or that value of soil. Um, how about then actually growing the food? Now, um, yesterday I was shoveling some compost into a wheelbarrow to put with the wood ash on um, an area we have at the house in a greenhouse and you know, Miss Fitness here, I tweaked my back. I can promise you if you gardened, you know you move when you garden. So moving gives you health benefits. Um, there was a study in 2000, <coughs> excuse me, that said that you got about $800 per person per year of financial reward per moving. That's how much moving and being physically active saved you. You have fewer doctor visits, fewer sick days, and the list went on and on. And more recently, a different paper, and I forgot the parentheses at the end of this, but 25000 per year per person. If you work in a garden, you are moving. It may not be quite the same as running a 10K, but it's some level of movement. So, and here I 
cleverly put the picture of the guy shoveling the compost to reflect my tweak back. But anyway, and by the way, no doctor expense with that. I went swimming last night, took care of the tweak back. I'm fine now. Um, so say you get a fraction of those benefits um, and that only one person gardens on each of those plots. That's $50,000 for the garden as a whole of health benefits just from moving, okay? And that's $5,000 per ton of compost. So you get better food, you get ecosystem services, you get um, better health. And remember when you were all worried about transport or fugitive emissions from composting? Um, I, I didn't mean that in a bad way, but just to say that compost using the compost and the value of that is so much more but let's get even broader than that realize that making compost can change the lives of the people that make it um community composting brenda could talk to you for four days about this i'm going to give just a couple of examples um and this is again from the urban ag books this is just one program of many and you see these across um the country, there's a program in Olympia called Grub, Garden Raised Bounty. It started as a one and a half acre farm in Olympia, and it's been expanded to work in combination with a number of high schools across Olympia and partly funded by the Gates Foundation. They um, offer agriculture-based employment training and dropout prevention programs for engaged and at-risk teens. And what they've seen here with um, the GRUB program in the two-year pilot, you can read these stats. If you get these at-risk kids, and there's a different program with Seattle Tilth that's showing the same thing, um, you get kids understanding science, engaged, um, not so angry, better grades, better graduation rates. It's fabulous. And if you look online, um, for the change in income with somebody who has a high school diploma or doesn't have a high school diploma, that's about a $10,000 a year difference. So by getting people involved in composting and growing food, think of that impact in addition to the eating better, in addition to the ecosystem services, in addition to the methane avoidance, and it's pretty damn impressive. Um, one program that I am very involved with it's one of my favorite parts of the job and a shout out to the guys you'll see your pictures if you're listening um you're seeing for the guys that and the women that didn't have the opportunity to get involved in composting when they were an at-risk youth um if you end up as an inmate and one of the issues that we have in the u.s right now is just a vast number of inmates um, there's a whole sustainability and prison program that's based in washington state and it's been copied in other states. And what you have is composting is an integral part and growing food is an integral part of this program. Um, I do a lot at the Monroe um, facility where they have vermicompost, worm compost, black soldier fly, which is super cool, um, and bokashi, which is a kind of fermentation. Um, they um, take all of the food waste or the vast majority of the food waste from their unit. You can see some of the worm compost bins and some of the guys involved in the program and they have a compost certification program run through the university behind beyond bars and so not only are you having nature exposure here you're having food waste diversion here you're having on-the-job training um, here are some stats on the program um, they deal with about 20,000 pounds of food a month and we're actually um, working with field plots at the prison to look and as well as some other sites to see if as you make soil healthier you make food itself healthier looking at vitamin concentration and nutrient concentrations in the food um, so you can read some of the program stats and here are some of the guys nick is the guy that started this you can read about him in biocycle and juan is our favorite um yield measure oh am i going too slow or too fast here. Anyway. Um, You're good. You're good. Okay. Anyway, um, and you can read about his experience and you can really see the impact that composting can have on a life. 
Okay. And here are some of the some of the groups involved in this. Okay. Okay. And here we go through some of the stats on why this is important. And this is, I think you get the point here. And let's go back to that bad color metaphor. Um, remember our composting, we started with that black and white and then landfill was a dead end and compost was uh, that beautiful full spectrum. The main thing I'd love for you to have gotten out of this is that not only does compost give you a powerful tool to reduce um, greenhouse gases to avoid methane release, using that compost gives you such a wide range of benefits from making soil healthy and soil is so fundamental to our civilization but making the people that work with that soil healthy in a community garden um, using that as an example you get healthy because you move more and you eat better and there's a value associated with each of these. And then finally, using and understanding um, how to work with soil, how to turn that waste into something that has such a fabulous impact on so many things. The impact of that on people is, is so astounding that the value of these materials goes so much behind be, beyond methane avoidance that it's silly that we, we don't broaden the discussion and take that into account whenever you're making that decision, should we compost or should we landfill? Those benefits are so important and so critical too. And that's the end of the talk. Thank you, Sally. I'm so glad that we invited you not only to talk about carbon sequestration, but all of those other eco benefits. And I think I could probably produce several posters and infographics with all your dollar figures. I think the 12,500 per ton of compost to for help soil form, the increased physical activity value, 5,000 per ton alone. We could, I could just visualize this. We should work together and you'll on check that. check the math before you do yeah, it. Yeah. No, there's, there's so much here. So again, if you have questions, uh, type them in. We already have um, uh, many questions. So before we do the question, we're just going to do um, a few uh, polls. So, uh, and uh, then we'll get into the questions. We have plenty of time for questions. So please stay on and see if we can get through all of them if we can. So the first polling question we're going to do, and Virginia is going to take back the controls. Here we go. How inclined are you, select all the apply, start composting, learn more about composting, reach out to, to compost, composters for additional information, support composting? Hopefully you know all about the benefits now. All right, so we're almost halfway through participation. And it's all, yep. Yeah, Okay, well, we have 89% supporting composting. Let's see, keep going. We have two thirds voted. All right, that's okay. Let's see the results. So, um, so most of you are going to support composting. One third start composting. Okay, that's good. Next question is which benefits of composting most interest you? So, here it's not select all you, all you select all, just pick one most interest you climate benefits ecosystem benefits the human well-being benefits and we're saying this all across the map i know you want to do select all that apply i know i do All right, we have close to 80%. All right, let's show the results, Virginia. So almost half ecosystem okay. service benefits, but two-fifths climate benefits. And of course, we care about the human well-being benefits. I know you do. Okay, so then this, this last polling question is really just as an introduction to the climate benefits of composting and other ecosystem service benefits that composting provides. Um, this webinar had too much information, the right amount of information, not enough information. Yeah. 
no fair for you to ask this while I'm on the line. No, no, it's actually, we've already got 80% the right amount of information. Okay. And only 6% too much information. And that's okay. with, we're getting close to two thirds of you voting. All right, let's just share it. Yep, 80% the right amount of information. So there you go, Sally. No okay. um, You're good. All right, so now um, let's uh, get into some of the questions. So I've tried to, um, group these, there's the sun that ha have, um, you know, uh, along a similar theme. So um, we have we have some questions about anaerobic digestion and incineration. So mm -hmm. there's been um, a few people who say, you know, our waste gets, gets burned. Um, what kind of comparison can you speak of between compost versus incineration? And then if you want to answer it the same way, is there's also questions about how does anaerobic digestion play into this? Okay, so um, here it's very easy to focus on food scraps, and um, I'll do that and give a little segue to make it a little bit broader. But remember um, how I said that food scraps were so good to make methane because they were 75% water. Um, there was just an article about whether the Boy Scouts has a future in the New York Times, but, um, or maybe it's the Washington Post. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is, if you were a Boy Scout, if you've ever tried to start a fire and you're working with something that's 75% water, you're not going to be very successful. Um, so when people say that combustion is a green option because of energy recovery, realize that that's a lie um, in terms of food waste because so much of the energy is used to evaporate the water that it takes all of the energy in the food waste or food scrap material um, to get rid of the water and then some. If you're talking about dry material like dry branches, that can be a different story, but again, by burning um, instead of composting, you're you, you're at that same dead end. Um, depending on what you burn, you can also emit very high amounts of nitrous oxide. So burning biosolids, for example, gives you um, nitrous oxide emissions, and that gas is about 300 times more potent than CO2. Um, that are about a ton per dry ton of material that you burn. Um, so combustion, unless you're dealing with something that's dry and very high in carbon and low in other um, energy, uh, low in other nutrients, is is a disposal method that's not good for anything. Um, anaerobic digestion is great, um, and anaerobic digestion doesn't mean that you can't then compost afterwards, and it certainly doesn't mean that you can't use the material afterwards for a soil amendment. Um, as I said earlier, I love biosolids. Those are primarily um, anaerobically digested and then used following that. Um, realize though, with stuff coming out of a digester, it can be smelly, gooey, and yucky, and not a product that you'd wanna use in your backyard. So very often it has to be um, treated or stabilized in some way before a homeowner can use it. All right, well, talking about yucky, smelly stuff, there were a few questions about odors and what contributes to odors. And I assume this is about uh, in a compost pile. Yeah. So do yeah. bad odors always signify anaerobic decomposition, decomposition? And related to that, what specifically contributes to odors besides methane? So methane is colorless. Um, um, okay, we're gonna get a little crass here. Um, everybody knows that farts stink and that you can light farts. This is just an effective way to, to explain this. The stuff um, that makes it stink, your fart, is hydrogen sulfide, which is a reduced sulfur compound. Methane is coming out same way as the hydrogen sulfide, but is flammable and is a source of energy. So in terms of composting, the one compound that can stink that is emitted in big ways by a compost pile, even if it's well aerated, is ammonia. Um, and that's a loss of nitrogen, and that's just nitrogen turning into um, a gas that can stink. M the vast majority of the other smelly compounds come from anaerobic decomposition, 
Um, they typically have um, sulfur in them and methane doesn't stink, doesn't have sulfur in it, but it's made under the same conditions that the smelly stuff, the smelly compounds are made. So you can reduce odors and reduce anaerobic decomposition and reduce methane by putting a layer of finished compost over your pile, uh, by putting a layer of wood chips over your pile and making sure your pile is well turned so that it has plenty of air circulate, circulating around. Yeah, and it's, it's probably worth to clarify that composting is an aerobic process. It's yes. not an anaerobic process like anaerobic digestion. And can you comment on the uh, ammonia emissions? Because we actually had a separate question on this. Is um, if, you're, if you're optimizing conditions in your compost pile or process, then you can, is it true, reduce uh, ammonia and some of these emissions? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, so there you go. Learn how to do it properly. And um, um, and it's also feedstock mix, mixing. There's some best practices. There's lots of resources. We have some. Others have. Uh, there's plenty of resources out there about how to avoid some of these emissions from composting. Um, so there's some questions about um, uh, can I don't know, you know, and you can pass on any of these questions, Sally. But can methane produced by food waste be considered biogenic, or is only carbon dioxide biogenic? So um, the deal is um, that food waste um, or plant matter. So realize that food waste is a is a subset of a broader category of plant matter. So like leaves falling off the trees, and we're we're in the season for that. Are typically food for microbes. They're eaten, and they're normally eaten and release CO2. And that is what's called the short-term carbon cycle. So the sun shines, plants photosynthesize, they make leaves, they um, make fruit, they make bark. And a good portion of that is returned to the atmosphere every year as CO2. Um, that is the short-term biogenic carbon cycle. The deal is when you have very special conditions, typically man-induced conditions, so that the bugs are producing methane instead of that CO2, or actually it's in addition to that CO2, that is considered non-biogenic and a greenhouse gas. Okay. So here's a question. Um, uh, make, it makes, quote, makes sense that adding organic material increases soil organic matter, but that is not surprising. If you have an empty cup and put water in it, then you have more water in the cup. I think the question is, how do we manage soils such that atmospheric carbon dioxide is removed from the atmosphere where it is in excess and is stored in the soil? How do we enhance that process? Okay, so... Um... One answer is to read that David Montgomery book, and that'll like say it all. In but that's 300 pages, and if you don't want to do that, realize that as we've used our soils, um, whether it's in a city or on a farm, um, we've typically not understood the need to treat the soil as a living thing and tend to it, um, because soils that have developed over thousands of years have been really resilient and able to take a fair amount of abuse, if you will. Um, by nurturing the soils, feeding the soils um, with compost, with cover crops, with reduced tillage, you are essentially treating the soil as a living thing and keeping it healthy. A healthy soil can grow bigger plants and can recycle more nutrients and can allow more water to get in, which in turn, all these things keep making that cycle bigger and bigger and bigger. Think of it in terms of your own fitness. If you've been a couch potato for 30 years, when you start walking around the block once a day, you'll see some benefits and soon you'll be able to walk around half a mile a day and that turns into a mile, that turns into 10 miles. So as you care for your soil, it gets more productive. That whole increasing the productivity of the soil is linked to that soil storing more carbon. So as you tend to the soil, the soil itself, because its productivity increases, um, keeps storing more and more carbon. So you're improving the soil's ability to function as a carbon sink. 
Good. And there was a question. Can Sally expand on the benefit of carbon sequestration with composting? I think you just did that. But if there's anything else, this would be a good anything else to add. This would be a good time. Um, think of the, that picture with Toby, the plus and minus the compost. Um, and, and think of that that metaphor with moving and eating well versus um, nachos on the couch every night. OK, that'll. Um, so we have a, a number of questions on biosolids, especially have to do with um, special considerations for using biosolids compost mm -hmm. in food production with heavy metals, pharmaceuticals, sure, sure, um, sure. antibiotics, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all yeah, that yeah. stuff take up. Um, yeah. So I think we okay. got three or four questions on that. So let's just let's okay. just do it. Yeah. Um, OK, so I can um, share with Brenda a paper that we did on that. But um, so realize that. It used to be back in the day, um, back in the day before wastewater treatment, that um, your poop made you sick. Um, um, fecal contamination of drinking water was responsible for any number of epidemics. And even to this day, you'll read about um, um, like lettuce recalls because they've been, the farm has been typically contaminated with animal manures. So, the huge public advance, health advance of the last century was understanding that we had to kill the pathogens in our poop um, to be able to safely recover the, the value in our treated poop and to protect public health. And we in the U.S. do a fabulous job of that. Um, so there's a whole regulatory structure um, that was developed several decades ago um, within EPA, when EPA was a large and well-functioning agency, um, setting standards that each municipality has to follow to treat its wastewater and allow for recovery of the of the value in the treated solids, in the biosolids. So part of that is regulating the metals. Real, the big two metals that you'll find in biosolids now are zinc and copper. And those are well within regulatory limits, and they were all done to protect human health and the environment. But realize also that zinc and copper are essential nutrients and that we typically don't add them to soil. So you'll see papers now, and this is part of the work we're doing now, looking at seeing if you use these sources of nutrients for soils, if you'll make the plants that you grow better for you by increasing the micronutrient concentration. Now, everything that you we are very inefficient in our eating and in our drug taking um so when you um take a drug um you'll absorb a certain amount of that and the rest goes out in your pee and poop and ends in the wastewater treatment plant um the drugs that we take are typically some chemical compound that contains carbon in it which is food for a microbe so a lot of these pharmaceuticals are degraded in the wastewater treatment plant. A very tiny portion um, can be in the biosolids. But um, realize that if you wanted to, um, like my back pain that I was complaining about earlier, if I wanted to take um, medicine for my back pain, I could take one tablet of Tylenol, or I could eat about 30 wet tons of biosolids. That's how much biosolids you would need to get the same amount as in one capsule of Tylenol. And also realize when you put those biosolids down, the microbes in the soil are going to chow that the food in there, including that Tylenol, down in about six months tops. So um, you're there's a bit of an answer on on a range of those biosolids questions, yep. and I use biosolids um, on all my crops, on all my in all my gardens. There's a follow-up question, which let me ask: Is what are the best resources we can use to convince our community that biosolids are safe and so good? Those uh, pictures, like Toby in front of the material, yeah, I I did a, a podcast for um, the Water Environment Federation called Words in Words on Water. If you're a municipality, if you make a product that you would use in your own backyard and you brag about it, there you go. Okay. Um, so there's some questions about. Um, 
different sources of organic material create different kinds of compost that have mm -hmm. different benefits. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a couple questions just on, you know, that some compost are better for certain plants. And then mm -hmm. also just how do you determine um, the quality of different, how might one compare the quality of different composts? So I don't know if that's, if you can uh, address so both of those. So some basic tools, there's U.S. Compost Council has a seal of testing assurance, STA, certified compost. Um, if you don't compost properly, you can make a compost that's still not fully cured and digested and stable. Um, that can get stinky pretty fast. So um, using an STA approved um, compost can be a really effective tool. If you ask about the ingredients that went into making the compost, if it has too much yard waste and not enough food waste, um, the nutrient content of the compost can vary a lot by season. So uh, when it's compost that's made from all those um, brave little Christmas trees that sacrifice themselves for your homes, um, you're going to have a compost that's very high in carbon, very low in nitrogen and other nutrients because it's a lot of woody material. That's going to be better as a mulch rather than as a nutrient for plants. Um, food waste, including food scraps and compost, typically makes them um, much richer and better food for your plants. Okay. Animal manures can also do that. So we have a question about biochar from somebody who's been farm composting since 1985 and is currently using biochar and pen pack for cattle and poultry, uses to help with the odor from home composting and states biochar deserves mention for home community composting. Do you have any thoughts or comments on biochar? So, um, so biochar, many people looked at biochar as like, oh my God, here's a tool, we can do something. Um, and this is gonna save the planet. Look at what it did in Brazil. Um, so biochar will not um, take a dead soil and on its own bring it back to life again. With that said, biochar has its place, especially biochar that's, again, biochar is a kind of combustion. It's, um, it's a material that's produced in a low oxygen, high pressure environment. It's, it's essentially a version of charcoal. Depending on how you make it, it can have a very, very high surface area, like activated carbon, and it can be great if it has a high surface area at absorbing odors. Um, fabulous. Okay. It can be a source of lime for soils. It can be a source of phosphorus and potassium, but biochar is at its best when it's used as an ingredient in a bigger mixture. So mixing it, and, and this is also what was found in the soils in Brazil that stayed alive due to char, it was due to char and compost, the terra preta soils that started making biochar famous. So if you use a little bit of char in with your compost, it'll give you some additional nutrients, it'll help absorb odor, um, odorous compounds, um, it'll be a nice source of acid neutralization. Okay, we could probably do a webinar alone just on biochar, something to think you about. You could do several, yes. Yeah, so there were some questions on carbon sequestration numbers from I think some of your slides. I don't know if it's worth um, trying to put those up or not. Um, but one was, why are the carbon sequestration numbers the same? Looks like negative 0.12 for landfill yeah, on okay. the slide with the data with the L LCA study, so maybe. Okay. So here's the deal. Um, the amount of carbon you're going to sequester in a soil will depend on a wide range of factors. It'll depend on how much compost you use, how degraded the soil is. The paper that I had up there was by Morris et al. was a meta-analysis and looking at different rates. A lot of those were default factors, assumed factors, or through computer modeling programs on soil carbon sequestration. It's really important, or if you really want to know how much um, carbon is sequestered in your particular site or in your particular case, that goes to how degraded your soil is, how much compost you use, and what kind of environment you live in. So it's sort of, um, you know, when you see a product and you see in the disclaimer, response may vary. That's true. We saw that in our sampling in Washington State. If you have a healthy soil that's been under turf for decades, turf is great at building 
at building um, soil organic matter and soil structure. Adding compost to that, not going to give you a huge carbon sequestration benefit. If you take a degraded soil or a farm soil or a compacted urban soil, um, you'll get a much bigger response and much higher rate of carbon sequestration. Interesting. And and then actually somebody asked a question about turf grass. Did you, Do you perform any studies on turf grass, example, golf courses, or is that surface area negligible compared to arable land? Um, so uh, a guy <laughs> named Peter Gronfman had uh, called um, turf grass or or lawns are our largest crop because they cover more acres than anything else. Um, and so understanding how to best integrate compost into turf is really important. Um, I've had turf grass included in um, some studies I've done. I don't do a lot of work with turf grass. Is okay. that enough of an answer? Yeah, and okay. if we get more information from anybody, we can um, share that. So here's a couple of questions about um, the, incorporating the compost or the optimum percentage of soil organic matter. Um, so on, the, on that latter one, what is the optimum percentage of soil organic matter for average soils? And what are the advantages of having soil with very high SOM and how can you lower it? Um, so um, how can you increase it or lower it? Well, if, what are okay, the, it doesn't matter. You, okay, if, so well, it's two. What is the optimum, and then are there disadvantages of having soil with very high? And then, if that's the case, how can you lower it? Um, so, um, five percent is a great number. There are some soils called classified as histosols that are very high in organic matter, like thirty percent or more. I don't remember the exact number. Um, uh, a lot of our soils are more like um, half a percent to one percent organic matter. So five percent is a really good goal. If you have um, too much organic matter, just plow it a bunch. And the microbes having more access to oxygen will eat and reduce the organic matter really quickly. Okay. And then somewhat related is, is a question. Is the compost incorporated in the soil or just placed on top? It's you get a better benefit if you can incorporate it in. That's not always possible. You'll still get benefits if you place it on top. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, there's a lot of questions, and there's still 150 of you still on. Thank you for uh, staying on for all these all these questions. Okay. So, oh yeah, here's somebody. Do do a standalone biochar webinar. Okay, we'll work on that. Um, Thank you for a question I can't answer. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Um, my recent compost tests show low organic matter, and I don't understand why. That's not really a question, but um, what is the organic matter per matter percentage of a good compost? I think maybe those two are related. Uh, 40 to 70. Okay. All right. And would there be a particular reason of why a compost test would show low organic matter? Does that have to do with the with getting the a lot? Of, so if you get a lot of soil in your compost, soil is mostly mineral. That would do it. OK. So. All right. That's that's a reason um, we have. Um, there's, a, there's a question related to policy, which I don't know. I'm just kind of not going there, um, just focusing on what you what you covered. Um, uh, Sally, mm -hmm. um, let me ask you a question. This is about Paul Hawkins' international uh, project and report. Well, he was the editor of Drawdown, uh, mm -hmm. which is studying providing recommendations for reversing global warming, and mm -hmm. they've ranked composting number 60 out mm -hmm. of 100 solutions. Mm -hmm. And the question is, are you familiar with the studies related to this project, and why has it been r ranked so low? Because they didn't consider any of the benefits associated with use of compost. Yeah, so there you go. If you look at food, it's ranked number three. And then if you start understanding how the two can't be separated, you kind of like, oh, okay. Yeah. And I think actually I was just looking at that report. It's a fabulous report, by the way. You can get it online. Um, is that if you look at the whole food system from 
uh, farming, you know, to food waste and food rescue, food actually is the number one contributor to greenhouse gases. So again, it's probably just that when they rank composting, they didn't include how it's all interrelated. You know what the problem is, I can tell you right now, they didn't listen to this webinar. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> They'll have to do a, a, a version two. Um, on, it's a on great that. study. And yeah. yeah. So um, do you, let's see, let me just go. There's so many good questions. Um, uh, okay. I So somebody says walnut, wood, and ash, does that, is that good to compost? Do you, have you done any studies on, you know, um, I guess, I guess it, that has to do with acidity, right? And some of these um, feedstocks. So um, typically um, the, or the compost will come out to about a pH. It will be a pretty neutral pH. The char will raise the pH. We used, um, um, I had a student, Ryan Bajaika, who now is with the San Francisco Biosolids Program, and he made a range of soil blends with different kinds of urban woods and walnut char and just a regular biochar. Um, um, all of these can be good. You want to get your recipe there. I am not the right source on this. Um, there are others that like I know are um, Washington State University, Craig Cogger and Andy Barry teach uh, composting training workshop. Um, and um, Cornell has a lot of, of information about this and um, Brenda can point you into better information. These things can all be great ingredients in the right proportion. Okay. Um, so, um, since we have just a few minutes left, I'm just going to ask this one um, concluding um, comment, which is, um, if all the food scraps in America were to be diverted, composted, and applied to the soil in every possible location available, would that alone be enough to reverse climate change? Sally, no. I don't know if you can answer that. No. Yeah, no. And and so so here's the here's the thing that gets me. Um, so realize we make a lot more animal poop than um, human poop or food scraps, um, and we don't make enough of all of those things to fully stop soil degradation. We can do it um, to a you know. If we used animal manure, I've heard a figure about 10% of the arable land could be treated with animal manure. Um, biosolids, it's less than 1%. Food scraps would be 1% to 2%. Um, the fact that we're wasting any of this is the real tragedy because we have such a big problem and this is such an effective tool. Um, and especially um, in urban areas, soils play a critical role in urban areas. Um, and you think of urban areas as all concrete when in fact um, 30 to 40 percent in many cases are, is open space and how do you best use that material so this is a precious to me it's a precious resource um, it's a tool with great power but it's not going to fix everything yeah and you know we talked about we we both mentioned the marine carbon far farming project which their studies initially looked at applying a half inch of compost per year to their um, mm -hmm. marginalized rangeland. And we looked in the state of composting in the US, we looked at uh, ni the 99 million acres of cropland in the US that are eroding above soil tolerance levels. And if we were to apply half inch of compost to those 99 million acres, it would require about 3 billion tons of compost. And there is not enough compost to meet that need. So it just underscores the um, importance of not wasting any of our valuable food scraps and other uh, re, you know, organic materials that we could be converting into compost to improve soils. Any final comments, Sally, that you'd like to make? Thank you for hosting and thank you all who listened. Um, it's, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Our pleasure too. Thank you. Thank you to all. And this recording should be available in the next couple of days. We will send you the link. Okay. I'm going to hang up now. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, guys.